This week on Talking Pictures with Neil Rosen, we'll look at the latest Martin Scorsese crime drama, The Irishman, a documentary about the famed tabloid, The National Enquirer, and we'll check out the new biopic about Underground Railroad icon Harriet Tubman, along with my interview with its star, Cynthia Erivo. Plus, a look at a whole host of films coming your way with our holiday movie preview. We've got all that and many more movie picks coming up. I'm Neil Rose and welcome to Talking Pictures. It's our monthly critic roundtable show where we debate what's worth watching and what's not when it comes to new releases, hidden gems, and Hollywood classics. Joining me today are Bill McCuddy from Gold Derby, Lisa Rossman from Signs and Sirens, and Jack Rico from Showbiz Cafe. Now let's start out with a look at a few new films hitting theaters this month, beginning with the highly anticipated Martin Scorsese film, The Irishman, starring Robert De Niro as a hitman for the mob, and Al Pacino as union leader Jimmy Hoffa. Let's take a look at a clip. Hey, my friend. I got that kid I was talking to you about here. I'm gonna put him on the phone and let you talk to him, okay? Hello? Is that Frank? Yes. Hiya, Frank. This is Jimmy Hoffa. I heard you paint houses. No, no, please. No, no, Frank. Yes, I do, sir. Jack, tell us about The Irishman. Well, it's based on a book called uh, I Heard You Paint Houses by Charles Brand. And Martin Scorsese has been trying to do this movie for a very long time and finally got to do it with Netflix. Um, and it's directed by him, produced by him, and uh, it stars Robert De Niro, mm -hmm. Joe Pesci, Ray Romano, Anna Paquin, uh, Al Pacino. It's one of the great movies he's done since Casino. Uh, it's about an uh, Irish hitman by the name of Frank Sheeran and his role in the murder mystery of Jimmy Hoffa. It's one of the great unsolved mysteries in, uh, in America. And this kind of is like a counter history. It's almost a revisionist history of what happened compared to the traditional stories that we know about Jimmy Hoffa. There's not much you can say about this. This is an epic, epic. opera. It's tragic, but it's funny and it's ruthlessly violent. Trademark uh, Scorsese. We see him at the peak of his powers. We haven't seen anything like this since probably Casino. Uh, and for me, one of the really key things here is that it's a masterclass in long form storytelling. I haven't seen a three and a half hour movie move this fast since this film. Uh, Bill, I can't agree with this. I have a feeling Lisa liked the film too. And I, and I just, I'm the lone descender here, but I gotta tell you, this is, for me, like uh, Godfather 3, it's nice to have all these people back together again, but this story is just way too long. It's been told before by David Mamet and Danny DeVito, along with Jack Nicholson, in a movie called Hoffa, and they haven't done much to the story yeah. since then, except de-age everybody yeah. to make them look 20 and 30 and 40 years younger. No one's mentioning how this doesn't really work. Robert De Niro, to me, looks like a Cabbage Patch doll. He's got a puffy little pink face, and uh, this distracted me throughout the whole film. The only one I liked watching was Joe Pesci, who gives a refined kind of laid-back performance, and he's the best thing about the film. Does not need to be this long. Okay. Lisa. The only thing I agree with what, about what you just said is that Pesci is amazing. Pesci, this is you know they pulled Pesci out of retirement. Reportedly, they had to ask him like 50 times before he consented to do it, and he's amazing. We've never seen him like this. Powerful, restrained, full of gravitas. And I think that's the gravitas is the key to why I love this film so much. Yes, he's covered this material, like this kind of topic before, and this material specifically has been covered before. But this is a new Scorsese to me. I mean, this is like cinema gravitas. It is truly grown-up American filmmaking. And I think you almost can be forgiven for not liking it because something like this is so rarely on American screens anymore. It's a power Powerful film. Okay, to address your de-aging thing with this, they spend millions of dollars to de-age these people. It didn't bother me, but I will say in the beginning of the movie, when they call De Niro the kid and he's delivering meat on a truck and he's supposed <laughs> to be 25 years old, my wife who sat with me at the movie goes, I think he looks like he's about 50. So that wasn't very realistic, but that said, listen, it's a different kind of Scorsese film. Yep. If you're looking for the humor in Goodfellas or Casino, you're not gonna find that here. This is a very restrained, um, you know, they, he pulls back and Pesci would be the natural choice to play the crazy Al Pacino, Jimmy Hoffa character. And I like that they did the reverse casting, but this is a saga. It's a character study of this Irishman played by Robert De Niro, who's really, he's trying to connect with his daughter. By the way, the, the women roles in this is, are, I mean, even, are very diminished. I mean, it says a lot about how much I love this movie that I am not yelling about <laughs> how much the women are demoted in this film, but it's such an extraordinary work and it's so unrepentantly from a male perspective that I 
to just let it be. But it spans American history. I mean, we're looking at the yeah. Kennedy assassination, yeah. the botched Nixon presidency, and then things like they recreate the, the killing of Joey Gallo in front of uh, Umberto's clam house in, in Little Italy. I wasn't bored. It's too long. No. It's three and a half hours, and it was made for Netflix, so I don't think most people are going to see it in one fell swoop. Yeah. Netflix yeah. doesn't care if you so go to I the movie theater. It doesn't need to be seen in a movie theater. Let's be clear can, about it, that. No, but it it's actually, not cinematic in scope. It, half of the movie it takes place in a car. It, you don't need you to could, see you this. You could break it up into three parts but it's, on Netflix. But it, I disagree with you. It's right. a ravishing looking yeah. film. I like the film. It, 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 it's just not your typical Scorsese, but it, it's an epic, you know? All right. All right, next up is a new biopic about Harriet Tubman called Harriet. Lisa. In a perfect world, there would be many biopics already of Harriet Tubman, but unbelievably, this is the first one. And here is the thing. It's uh, directed by the director of Eve's bio, Casey Lemons, who weirdly has not made a movie since then, even though that one was great. Harriet Tubman is played uh, by Cynthia Erivo, who is fantastic in Widows. And the two of them together really capture Tubman's bravery and heart. You know, it's a profoundly inspiring story of how this young slave woman not only freed herself, but countless other slaves. But, and unfortunately there is a but, the filmmaking is pretty formulaic. I would say what the kids like to call basic. <laughs> the power of Harriet Tubman does shine here, but I was disappointed. I just felt like it could have been a finer vehicle. Every flashback she has is the exact same flashback. Yeah, this is a movie about slavery, but put on the format of a Lifetime movie. Absolutely. It's very lifetime -y. Yeah, it Very lifetime -y. With a bigger budget and better cinematography, you know? And it's a huge disappointment for me. I mean, when you compare this movie to Birth of a Nation or 12 Years a Slave, it has no gravitas whatsoever, and you kind of just lose yourself. I mean, it's not memorable in any way, and uh, it's barely passable. I think also, no disrespect to the to the rest of the actors. It's like they cast the lead, and she's great, and then everybody else was just kind of an afterthought. It, mm -hmm. It's not. I agree with the lifetime thing completely, and I also think a lot of the dramatic moments in this film are missing. They're not right. there. We see how she escaped once, but then every time she goes back and brings other people, it just cuts from you want to go to hey, we're free. I mean, and what are they going to do? Have that exact moment? No, no I, but I, don't but I mean, there, there were yeah. there were options. They showed you where there were, the there safe were places houses. where yeah. there could have been a lot yeah. more tension, and it wasn't there. Yeah. And that's a real disservice to this story. No, well, I I don't I, look. I agree with you, Jack, that it is as I said, as you said, a lifetime type of movie. But that said, I think it's a good primer if you don't know this story. And mm -hmm. okay, so it's not the most innovative way of storytelling, but I think it's piloted by uh, Cynthia Erivo's performance. She's great. And, and I think she's terrific. And I think Janelle Monet also gives a very good performance as the... Uh, as the freed woman who helps her yes. rehabilitate. You know what? She's always amazing. Janelle is yeah. an amazing actor. Yeah. She doesn't get enough credit for that. All right. Well, anyway, I sat down with Cynthia Erivo and talked to her about the movie Harriet. Let's take a look. Did you feel the weight of responsibility of doing this? I mean, Harriet Tubman, to my knowledge, never had a feature-length film no, made about no, her. So know. did you, was there like all this pressure to get it right? And if you don't get it right, you know, is that going on in your head? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I felt the, the responsibility, uh, uh, but that doesn't frighten me. Um, that probably pushes me and makes me more determined to, to do the things I need to in order to try to get it right. Um, and it means I just put everything I am into it. Hopefully, uh, that served me well. Um, because I don't, you never know until you see something. But, you know, I did have that in my mind that I wanted to really get this right and, and try and do her justice and, yeah, tell her story. So the next one we're going to talk about is something called Jojo Rabbit. Bill? Good luck describing this one. <laughs> exactly. I'm gonna, what I want to I'm 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 enjoy you describing it. Have fun, kid. This is, uh, as maybe you've already gotten the sense that this is going to perhaps be a very controversial film. It's a dark comedy starring Adolf Hitler. Writer-director Taika Waititi plays the Fuhrer, who appears only to 10-year-old Roman Griffin Davis. It's World War II Germany, and the young Roman just wants to be a Nazi. He, he goes to a kinder camp run by Sam Rockwell, where uh, he refuses to kill a bunny and gets the title nickname. Mom Scarlett Johansson is supportive, but she's hiding a young Jewish girl in the house. She's played sweetly by Thomason McKenzie. None of this should work, and despite dramatic tone shifts, or maybe because of them, this is one of my favorite films of the year so wow. far, 2019. And I want to give a special shout out to JoJo's best friend, Yorkie, played by Archie Yates, who steals every scene he's in. Jack? I have mixed feelings about this film. Uh, I understand everything you're saying, Bill, but to me, the movie didn't come to life to the last 30 minutes. Mm. Uh, there's a particular scene that essentially encompasses 
everything that the movie is. And from that moment, the movie sort of pierces through the screen. Uh, the little boy, uh, he's excellent. Uh, and I understand the Mel Brooksian satire on Hitler, but this movie just seemed out of place for today. And I just don't understand the rationale for making this. A lot of people are saying that. I agree with that. I disagree. You know, I, I think all the whole cast was good. And look, I learned with three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri, that not even yeah. Sam Rockwell can save certain <laughs> films for me. Right. And this is another one that really? ironically has Sam Rockwell. I mean, what's the point? To show how brain conditioning like works, to show that empathy doesn't always come naturally. I mean, just to be a surrealist satire, like we're living in real life right now. And right, surrealist that's the point. No, I, I disagree. Like because of that, I did not have the patience for this this movie. Okay. We, need I, I, we need a good anti-hate satire. I, I, I agree with you, Bill. And first of all, um, satires on Hitler from To Be or Not To Be with Jack Benny to the producers to... Uh, to what a great genre. Okay, so here's the thing. Oh this is gosh. an original, unusual film, and I didn't know where this thing was going in the beginning. I mean, all of a sudden, it's showing this, like, blind allegiance to, like, these, the Hitler youth, and I'm going, what in the world is going on here? And it's funny, but I'm going, you know, I'm a little offended, and all of a sudden, the thing takes this turn, and everything makes sense. Right. I'm emotionally moved. Um, when he discovers the Jewish girl that Scarlett Johansson, his mother, is hiding in the attic, and she's wonderful, the, play, the girl who plays her. And, and I'm like, you know, I'm moved by this movie. I, I'm, I'm with you. It's on my 10 best but list. Neil, also. I think it it's worth terrific... recommending. What? He, is it he, worth he recommending? It's on my 10 best list. list. Yeah. It's of terrific. It it's terrific. It, it, it emotionally moved me, and it's funny. And, and, and how many how many times do you see something that's that fresh and original? That's good. Your 10 All best right. lists always have a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> moving Kosher on. Salt. Kosher salt. <laughs> moving on, there's a new Terminator movie hitting theaters called Dark fate jack this is uh, brings back james cameron to the franchise and it's directed by tim miller who did deadpool so he's a great action uh, director and it brings back the whole cast including linda hamilton and it takes place uh 22 years after terminator 2 and it's essentially the same plot the same storyline that we've seen in terminator 1 and 2 where two cyborgs from the future come back to the present time one of them to kill uh, someone that's going to affect the future and the other one to protect them in this particular case, I thought that this was probably the best Terminator movie since mm. Terminator 2 Judgment. Absolutely. So yeah. good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's good. arguably one of the best action movies of 2019 in my particular case. And the reason it's so good is because James Cameron is back, and and, yeah. and and he wrote it, and he produced it. But Linda Hamilton right here really is the spark, the energy. She kicks butt. No, she everything butt. about this movie kicks butt. <laughs> I love this movie, yeah. and I honestly was more surprised than anyone could possibly be that I did. Okay, the one caveat is that I don't think all the logic of the plot and the technology works, but who cares? It never does. Who cares? <laughs> who cares? Exactly, who cares? It's, it's a fun it's role. Let me say this. If they could come from <laughs> the future, <laughs> they were successful in the past. All right, That's all you need to don't know. Don't man interrupt me, because this movie stars three powerful broads, and it basically introduces a new cinematic trope, which is the power crone, right? I mean, Linda Hamilton, at this point, is 63 years old, and she's playing an action hero. I mean, not only has she survived, like, potential apocalypses and terminators, but she's survived sexism, she survived menopause, she is amazing. And Mackenzie Davis, who plays an augmented human from the future, is hella sexy. And Natalia Reyes, who is the third woman in this trio, is so, such a perfect heroine. I loved everything about it. I love that it's set in Mexico City. I love that it folds in a critique of our current quote unquote detainee system. It's an amazing movie. Bill? Yeah, listen, I like this movie oh too. Gosh. I think it is probably the best one since T2 and probably no ties question. with that one. And uh, the story is the same. We've learned it over and over and over. Mm -hmm. He comes back and back and back. <laughs> no, this it's is okay. new. This you know is what's new. funny is that as soon as Arnold shows up in the movie, it sort of grinds to a halt for a second. And it gets a little dramatic for a moment. That's I'm like, good. uh oh. No, and then it goes right, right back yeah. in. Yeah. The women take back over, and it goes right into a full action. He's not the ultimate again. savior, which is Neil. So what good. I was going to say here is that one of the things, as a Latinx film critic, this movie is Latinx. It, the future of America, according yes. to James Cameron, is Latinx, and I thought that that was. Uh, imposing in a great social commentary. The future is film. Latinx and feminine. And I'll tell you, yeah. it's amazing. <laughs> Not exactly. only is it so much fun, but the technology, which I loved in, in Terminator 2, where, and I, and I still love this, when um, these Terminators like get killed and they melt and all the liquid, well, that CGI technology has improved like a hundred times since then. Mm -hmm. If only Martin Scorsese had used some of that <laughs> in the Irishman. All but right, it, all right, get off your high horse. It's uh -huh. a lot of fun, and I, I recommend it. So anyway, Scandalous is the name of a new documentary all about the history of the famed tabloid, the National Enquirer. Lisa, tell us about this. You know, I think this movie would be a great companion to the Roy Cohn 
documentary that yeah. we talked about last mm -hmm. time. Uh, as you said, it focuses not only on the history of the National Enquirer, but also its influence on the American landscape, especially our politics. You guys know I worked for a decade in the gossip industry, which I am not proud of, and not even I understood the full extent of this tabloid's nefarious history, starting with the fact that it was originally financed by the mafia. Hello? <laughs> and it like that's looks That's everything. No, that's amazing. You know, and it, it sort of moves us through his the, the, that legendary takedown of Gary Hart, which pretty much changed American politics for good. And then it's extremely and terribly incestuous relationship with President Trump. I mean, this story is basically better gossip than the gossip that it reports, and it also shows how gossip as a commodity has really weakened American values and helped us get in this mess. Bill? What's remarkable is that they did break some of the biggest stories about OJ and about some, as you mentioned. They beat the cops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the uh, tablets with, with yeah. the Bruno right. Mali shoes. I right. mean, it's like amazing. The National Enquirer actually solved and it's that all here. changed and, everything and about America. People like Judith Regan, who I worked with at Fox News, who worked there early on in her career. Uh, there were some really credible people behind the scenes at this thing. And that's what you learn about here. I was really entertained by it. I thought this was a very highly entertaining documentary. I learned so much. But it really then is, to me, uh, as, uh, as a journalist as well, Understanding the the imposing nature of what the National Enquirer did for the rest of journalism. I mean, and when you say did, you mean ruined. Ruined uh, <laughs> to a certain extent, but the Bob Hope story was incredibly. Yes, the Bob Hope me. story about I how I want to tell you, I bettered right. them all. <laughs> it, was, it was called Catch and Kill. They were. He had Bob, a casting couch. Right. I mean, you guys, the insights you, they on squashed this the story. As a the person who, and you know this too. Th that's real stuff. That happens all the time. They squash one story, you know, so they can tell another, and vice versa. And it references a lot of the Ronan Farrow oh and Harvey Weinstein oh issue that's gosh. happening today. That was happening back then with Hope and everybody else. So. The irony is the documentary is of much higher quality than the National Enquirer was every day. <laughs> <laughs> so well, true. It's interesting. It's true. The National Enquirer was a laughing stock and a joke amongst mainstream media, yeah. and now mainstream media has adopted a lot of the. Uh, techniques of, of, of the National Enquirer. I also found it interesting that at the beginning of the documentary, the National Enquirer was showing these crime, bloody crime scene photos, and the guy who was very interesting about him, too, the guy, this guy Pope, his last name was Pope, who uh, was the owner of the magazine, they said, uh, he goes, I want to get into supermarkets. We can't show these photographs in supermarkets. Very Great, we'll do, we'll do celebrity right. tabloid journalism. So good. And it just made that switch, and it's, it's very, very interesting. And, um, yeah, as you said, not only with Bob Hope, but they also squashed the Cosby thing. They had all this, the dirt on Cosby, and he's like, you want exclusives to the set of the Cosby mm -hmm. show? Squash the story. So it was all this, like, bribing and trade. Fascinating documentary. Check it out. Well, the holiday movie season is upon us, and that means lots of different types of films are coming your way over the next few months, many of them Oscar contenders. So what we're going to do is take a look at what we're most looking forward to and what we think audiences are eagerly anticipating. So here's a look at a few. So the great Carol Shelby is going to build a car to beat Ferrari with a Ford. Correct. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Please, won't you be my neighbor? That was wonderful. I thought we should talk. OK. I don't know how to start. You know why Ron just got that door blocking his office. Someone has to speak up. Someone has to get mad. Bill, hit me with a movie that you're looking forward to or that's coming to theater soon. I can't wait for Ford v. Ferrari. I'm a gearhead, and I'm, even though I'm told it's a lap too long over two <laughs> hours, uh, I got to see Matt Damon and Christian Bale take on Enzo Ferrari. Although, I hear the guy who steals the trophy at the end of the movie is Tracy Letts as Henry Ford II. Saw so, it, and you're right. Tracy Letts steals the movie. Go ahead, Lisa. Frozen 2. I didn't even think I was <laughs> Frozen like, 2? I didn't think I was going to like the first musical, and then I loved it. So it's the same creative team, and reportedly they do deeper exploration of Norse mythology and female autonomy, so hello, count me in. Mm. 
<laughs> a man. Oh, you sexist. Oh. Big surprise. <laughs> right. I'm looking forward to a beautiful day in the neighborhood. You know, Tom Hanks could play every anybody. Now he's playing Mr. Rogers. Unlike, you know, once again, you're really going out on a limb here. <laughs> unlike the oh, the Tom Hanks movie about uh, <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Wow, well, I mean, unlike oh. the documentary Won't You Be My Neighbor that came out last year, which was an entire biopic of his life. This basically looks at one incident, and Matthew Reese plays a journalist from Esquire who's very cynical about having to interview Mr. Rogers, and of course, the kindness of Mr. Rogers uh, overcomes his cynicism. All right, go I ahead. I feel bored just hearing about it. <laughs> All right, Bill, go ahead. We don't mean to be cynical. Go ahead, Bill, what do you got? Uh, this is called The Report. It guy, Adam Driver, is uh, a special investigator looking into the CIA cover-up of the detainee torture, but Annette Bening is the secret weapon of this thing. I've seen it, and she's Diane Feinstein. It's really quite a great performance. Alisa? Little Women. Uh, oh, the news. How, listen, how many times are we going to see? No, 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 no. Again, no. I'm just going to use the word sexism. Like I'm just going to no, leave I'm with it you. there. I'm five I'm with you. Okay, five versions of, of this thing. That, no, the, it's my favorite. Not book. with Greta Gerwig. Every version of it is great, <laughs> and this one is directed by Greta Gerwig, who's fabulous. It stars your girlfriend, Cheers to Ronan, and Sarsha. Sarsha. See, you love her. You know how to pronounce her crazy name. <laughs> oh, it's got Meryl Streep. I mean, and you guys, let me just say, what other story gives us four women front and center from a 19th century narrative? It should be told. This trailer looks amazing, I have to say. Amazing. Been there, done that. Go ahead, Jack. <laughs> what else do I have to say? Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. This is essentially the ending of all nine films Thank with God. Lucas. Thank you're like, they're, you're like says, they're not going to make another 50 more. Well, not with Luke Skywalker, Leia, Harrison Ford. Like, th th those days are over. And the nostalgia uh, and the segue transition into the new generation of Star Wars characters, including the Netflix TV show and everything, that's what we're about to see. So if you were born in the, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, this is the movie you have to see it's the finale hope, so. hope of it's it all. better than the last couple yeah there have been mm -hmm. snoozes yeah. the force will be with you always here's a movie that not only am i looking forward to i've seen this movie and it's wonderful it's called marriage story it's directed by noah bomback it really should be called divorce story because it's really about the crumbling of a marriage and how lawyers get involved and make a bad situation infinitely worse adam driver who i can guarantee you is going to get an oscar nomination for this as well as scarlett johansson or the couple that are having a lot of problems and it's about how their life does uh, you know fall apart and how they're kind of struggling to keep their family together and their and their relationship with their child this is wonderful i highly recommend also on my 10 best list. Saw it where you did at the Hamptons Film Festival and have to say it's one of the best movies of the year and certainly a great movie about the topic. Great writing, great direction, amazing acting. Bill, give me a movie. Bombshell. Fox News is getting its close-up yes. again. Can't wait to see Why this. Why is Hollywood like Noah's Ark? Everything comes out in twos. We had the Showtime version with Russell Crowe. Which was great. The loudest voice. Which was great. The loudest I'm, voice, I'm right? I'm looking forward to this. But, this, is, to but this. this has more powerful women, I yeah, have to I say. Yeah, I think so. You got Nicole Kidman, Charlize Theron, and Margot Robbie, and be good. Uh, they eventually bring down a different Roger Ailes, but uh, altogether, it's worth telling again. Well, she looks, Charlize looks really like Exactly Megan. like Megan. And Kelly. it's supposed to be funny. Yeah. So, which And some of the real Fox News people are in it, which I don't even know how they got permission to do that. I'm so excited for this movie. Yeah, I am excited for it, even though I thought that the loudest voice on Showtime really did cover the subject pretty well. All right, all right. All right, Lisa, go ahead. Dark Waters. This is a psychological and environmental legal thriller starring my boyfriend, Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, the headline is that it's directed by Todd Haynes, who's directed gorgeously rendered in heartfelt right? films like Far From Heaven right? and Carol. Right? I am yes, so excited about this film. I don't no even mind that it stars uh, Anne Hathaway. Hello. I have Mark Ruffalo's wife on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what about Cher's <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward to The Two Popes. It's been winning awards in all the film festivals, standing ovations. It's directed by Tom yeah. Cooper, mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Hopkins, Jonathan Price, and it's the story, a fictional history uh, of these two popes that get together, and it's slightly based on, on reality, where Pope Francis Francis resigns in 2013 not to take the papacy uh, or becoming the Pope. And what ultimately happens is this comedic drama about the chemistry of these two people in this religious background that you don't really see very much on film. And speaking about, you mentioned the Hampton Film Festival. It won the audience award at the Hampton Film Festival. Well, I saw it there, and I'm telling you, it's a great I movie. It's probably one of the best films Johnson of the year, Price correct? I can't believe yeah, the two old guys yeah. sitting around talking for two hours. It's a good movie, and it really That is. sounds like every movie I have to watch. Are you kidding? Well, we're half of this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of this show. Well, Bill, give me a movie. I can't believe I'm about to say Adam Sandler may be nominated for an Oscar. What? But, but I've seen Uncut Gems, where he's a degenerate gambler on 47th Street here in New York. It's excellent. Wow. So I, I, I recommend it highly. You're taking my money all over town, placing bets. Howard, where's the money right now? Howard, got my money? Howard! Howard. The title is salacious. 
And I don't know about Adam Sandler. Uh, mm. Miami's better in dramatic roles. Yeah, Punch Drunk Love. Punch Drunk Love. All right, you guys are gonna roll your eyes, mock me if you like. Mock but, me! <laughs> but the movie I'm excited about is Cats. Cats! The oh, long-awaited, much ridiculed adaptation of the hit Broadway musical that is in turn <laughs> an adaptation of a poem starring the likes of Dame Judi Dench, Ian McKellen, Jennifer Hudson, Taylor Swift. Hello, in cat suits? That's funny, even if it's bad, this I'm movie's gonna be good. I'm coughing up a fur ball this just thinking of this. This movie at least will launch drinking games. No, no, no. Well, I was gonna ask you what you're least looking forward to that's what I'm least looking forward to uh, this <laughs> holiday season I, and I say watch the trailer if you like that it go looks amazing. Oh, please come on Jack what's your least what's your least looking probably for? cats and I'm so sorry <laughs> to say this haters I mean, the, haters it didn't it didn't really work on Broadway uh, no but, it really did oh yeah no. It, nobody everybody agrees with you it was so unsuccessful that play you, you guys it only it's a classic right. sorry right. about oh, the oh, water yeah. on the block oh, so, you guys it's a classic for the wrong Oh, it's, it it's ridiculed for, 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 but only thing I'm really looking forward to is the song Memories. I mean, that's the real reason I want to see well, it. I'm not looking that, forward to Cats it. either, but I'm also not looking forward to Charlie's Angels. And I can't believe I'm saying that because- Yeah, enough already. Kristen Stewart's in it, but man- You guys this, hate the, women. The, the, no, we don't hate oh. women. I liked the first- <laughs> We just hate some women. Yeah, uh, no, no, I, wait, no, I'm kidding. Listen, it's- it, I liked the first one. I sort of liked first the TV second one. Series, the no, first no, 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 the, the, the movies with uh, Drew Barrymore and right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, this looks you guys, dead on arrival. You guys, how many Fast and Furious movies are there? I don't hear you complaining no, let's about go back that. To, what are you? Least, what are you, are you go back to cast? Okay, the movie I'm least looking forward to is A Million Little Pieces, which is the adaptation of this hateful, like James Frey memoir from the '90s that was exposed as a hoax. Why are they making a movie based on a book that's already been? Disregard it. I don't get it. Even Oprah apologized, and he had to apologize to Oprah well, about it. So why are they making a movie? All right. Well, we'll see. The jury's out. The trailer looks bad. So yeah. you know. Anyway, well, that's about all the time we have. I want to thank Bill McCuddy, Lisa Rossman, and Jack Rico. I'm Neil Rosen. Join us next time on Talking Pictures.